Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we've been able to hear your voice as your word has been read to us. And uh, help me now as I explain this word to do so clearly and faithfully and help our response to this word be one that truly honours you. For you, our Lord, are worthy of all glory and honour. And it's in Jesus' precious name that we now pray. Amen. Uh, for those of you who are visiting with us, uh, a few months ago uh, in this church, we did a Christian maturity survey. And uh, last week, I started to share uh, some of the results of that Christian maturity survey, especially around how uh, people relate to church leaders. Today, I want to share with you some results about prayer, uh, in particular, how often we pray and the kinds of things that we pray about. So when it comes to how often we pray, uh, there was a statement in the survey, I pray to God, and you can see up on the screen that 68.85% said I pray every day, 19.67, at least four to six times a week. So there's around 88, 89% of people who are praying at least four to six times a week. So that's great, although we'd love to see this everyday number at 100%. Uh, the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17 says, pray continually. And I take it when he says pray continually, he's not meaning a couple of times a week, but multiple times uh, throughout the day. Uh, and indeed, friends, it's good that we come before God and pray because we're actually honouring him as we do so. We're acknowledging that he's a good God, that he's a powerful God, that he's a generous God. We honour God as we pray. So let's try and pray every day. Now, when it comes to what we pray for, uh, we had this statement, my prayers desire outcomes that will ultimately bring honour to God. And you'll see that 87.1% either agreed or strongly agreed with that. Now, uh, friends, remember that we exist to bring glory and honour to God in all that we do. Uh, remember that the Lord Jesus, when he taught his disciples to pray with the words of the Lord's Prayer, said, Our Father in heaven hallowed be your name, which is another way of saying, may your name be honoured. The very first request in the Lord's Prayer is a request asking that God would be honoured. And friends, I want to suggest to you that everything that we should pray for, or that we pray for, really should have the ultimate goal of bringing glory and honour to God as that prayer is answered. So as we pray for people who are sick, we pray that they might be healed so that God would receive glory and honour. As people are out of work, we pray they might get work. Why? So that God might receive glory and honour through that. And so I want to, again, in encourage you to think about, as you pray, are you focused on outcomes that ultimately bring honour to God? And it would be great to see 100% uh, strongly agree on that. For God is indeed worthy of that honour. Uh, Another thing that we highlighted in the survey uh, was the statement, I pray regularly for God to provide for my needs. And uh, we see there that it's about 74, 75% of people agreed or strongly agreed with that. And it's a good thing uh, to come before God and to ask him to provide for our needs. Indeed, the Lord Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread, which I take it is coming to God and asking for him, the one who provides all things, to provide uh, for our needs. Um, again, as we come before God and ask for that, we are acknowledging that he is the source of all things, that he has the power to provide for our needs, and thereby we honour God uh, as we come and ask him about those things. So again, it'd be great if that number here was 100%. Uh, and then finally... I pray regularly for the work of my church. And so you'll see that the number is around about 61, 62% who agree or strongly agree on that. Now, can I say, and you've heard me say this numerous times, that prayer is the chief work of ministry and mission because God is the chief agent of ministry and mission. Uh, friends, as we seek to fulfil our mission uh, to make disciples for Jesus Christ and mature them in the faith, uh, that is only possible by the work of God. And so prayer is the means which God has appointed for us to call upon him to be at work and by which he then works. Because as he works in response to our prayers, he receives glory and honour. 
And so I want to urge you, friends, uh, we need prayer uh, for the work of this church. And so it'd be great if that number was also 100%. Now, the reason why I mention these uh, different uh, responses in our Christian Maturity Survey about prayer is because today we come to the last sermon of our series on the book of Hebrews. Uh, we're focusing on verses 18 to 25 to chapter 13. And in these verses, we see the writer asking his readers to pray for him. But we also see the writer praying for his readers. And so we're going to have a look at those things and what we are going to do is to see if there is anything that we can learn about how we go about prayer as we look at those verses. So that's where we're heading this morning. And there are three main things that I want to highlight. First of all, the writer of Hebrews requested his readers to pray for him, believing that he was worthy of their prayers. So look at verses 18 to 19. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honourably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. Pray for us, he says. Uh, the word pray there is in the present tense. It's a keep on praying for us. Pray for us continually uh, is the kind of idea. Uh, there's an us there. There's debate as to whether he is referring to him and a group of others or just using the sort of the royal plural just to refer to himself alone. Uh, but he's certainly asking for prayer for himself. Notice that he says, we are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honourably in every way. Uh, there is a sense where he is trying to demonstrate to them that he is worthy of their prayers. He is worthy of their prayers. Now, we're not sure if uh, something had happened to him that would have caused his readers to question uh, his credibility, to question how honourable he was. But the point that he's making is, uh, pray for us, so pray for the work that I'm doing in my ministry, and be assured I am worthwhile praying for, because in response to the gospel, I am seeking to be like Jesus. I am seeking to live uh, the God-honouring way that Jesus calls upon us to live. I am seeking to persevere in the faith, doing what Jesus would have me do. That's the idea. So he says, pray for us because we're worthy of your prayers. And in particular, he wants prayer that he might be restored to his reader soon. Now, to uh, give us a bit of an understanding as to why he might be praying that, let's look at what verses 22 to 24 say. Brothers and sisters, he says, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation, for in fact, I have written to you quite briefly. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all the Lord's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Let me start with the, uh, the last sentence there. Uh, the writer is obviously apart from his readers. Now, there's debate as to where he was. Uh, some people think, on the basis of that last sentence, that he was in Italy, writing to people outside of Italy. Uh, that's one way in which you can read that verse. But there's another way in which you can read it as well. That the people that he's writing to were in Italy. And that as he writes to them, he has some others who are with him, wherever he was, who were from Italy. And so he's saying, well, those who are with me here from Italy send you their greetings. And uh, a lot of the commentators tend to lead towards that second uh, idea, that he was writing to Christians in Rome. From somewhere else. Now he uh, says in verse 22, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation. Uh, this idea of a word of exhortation is another way of describing a sermon and he's referring to everything that he has written to this point in the book of Hebrews. So basically what we have in the book of Hebrews is a written sermon and we've been hearing over the last couple of terms that really at the heart of this sermon is his desire for his readers to persevere in the faith. So we've been hearing about how they've been tempted to go back to being religious Jews because they are starting to encounter persecution. They are starting to encounter hardship. And so throughout this sermon, he has been striving to urge them to keep following Jesus. And notice that he says it was a brief sermon. 
Some of you might be thinking, we thought Mark went for a long time. Uh, the book of Hebrews, that's pretty long, isn't it? And it's filled with stuff. But here's the thing. This isn't all he wants to say to them. He wants to be restored to them because he wants to build upon what he has written in this sermon. He wants to be restored to them because he is concerned about their spiritual welfare. He is concerned that they might not persevere. And so he asks for prayer that he might be restored to them so he can continue the work which he has started in this book of Hebrews. He's hoping that Timothy, uh, one of the Apostle Paul's uh, most trusted workers, will be able to come with him, given that Timothy had just been released, it seems, from prison. So, so here is this writer saying, pray for us, we're worthy of your prayers, pray that we'll be restored to you soon. Why? Because we want to continue on the work of encouraging you to stand firm that started with the letter, the book of Hebrews. Now, let's think about how all of this might apply to us. Well, you know, we have partners who regularly call upon us to pray for them. Uh, namely our missionary partners. Uh, we've got uh, the Wilsons up the top here who serve in Rovereto in Italy and we've been partners with them for about 30 years, I think it is. Uh, Richard is heavily involved in uh, getting electronic resources of uh, the Bible out to people in Italy. Uh, we've had Richard come visit us and his family on a number of occasions. He's a good gospel guy that we can trust. Uh, we've got uh, the Phelps. Uh, who worked with us for a couple of years before they went up to Forbes. And we know them, don't we? We know that they are good gospel people who are worthy of our support. And we've got Rachel McConkey, who ministers at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology down in Melbourne, uh, seeking to reach university students and to equip university students. And the reason why we support Rachel is because when she was living up in here in Sydney for a while, uh, she was working at a university campus and she had a very big impact upon one of our church members in terms of helping them to grow. And so we thought, Rachel is someone who is really worth supporting. All of these people, friends, are trustworthy gospel people. And what do they regularly do when they write to us? Well, they tell us about what's going on in their lives, but they also say, please pray. Please pray. Are we praying for our partners? Well, in the maturity survey, we had the statement, I pray regularly for my church's missionary partners. And what we see is that it's about 35 to 36% who agree or strongly agree. Uh, friends, as we pray for these ministry partners, we are joining with them in their ministry. That's certainly what the Apostle Paul talks about in Romans 15 when he calls upon his readers to pray for him, to join with him in his ministry. Again, God is the chief agent of mission and ministry. That's why prayer is the chief work. And these people are calling upon us to pray for them. And by partnering with them, we have actually said, we will pray for you. And so again, I want to suggest uh, we need to do much better than 35 odd percent of us praying regularly for these people. We need to get that number right up and make sure we're supporting them well. So what we see first of all in Hebrews, the writer asks for prayer. He says he's trustworthy, pray for my ministry, pray that I might be restored to you soon so I can build on what I've been talking about in my letter. Secondly, the writer of Hebrews prayed for his readers to grow in Christian maturity. Have a look at uh, verses 20 to 21. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So now he prays for them. And I want to just focus on verse 20 for a few moments, uh, because he tells us a lot about the God to whom he is praying uh, in this particular verse. Notice that he talks about, now, now may the God of peace, the God of peace. Uh, friends, the gospel tells us that we were God's enemies, 
that we actually deserved his wrath, that we deserve punishment from him, but that God has taken the initiative through Jesus to provide a way for those of us who once were his enemies instead to be at peace with God, to be people who no longer have to be afraid of being punished by God, to be people who no longer wonder if God could ever accept us, but to know that we are at peace with God and therefore we can approach God's throne of grace with confidence, as Hebrews 4 tells us. He's the God of peace. And the reason why we can have peace with him is because of the blood of the eternal covenant, that is the blood of Jesus, which was shed to bring the new covenant into existence. So as we've been working our way through the book of Hebrews, uh, we've heard the writer saying, don't go back to the old covenant ways. Don't go back to being a religious Jew. No, because the new covenant, which promised total forgiveness, has come in Jesus. And it came because he lived the perfect life that we could not live and because his blood was shed for us. On the cross, the punishment we deserve was taken by him to provide the way for us to have peace with God. And friends, it's because Jesus lived in perfect obedience to his father, even to the point of death, that God raised him from the dead and vindicated the Lord Jesus as the truly innocent one who was able to die in our place. And he talks about Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. Well, in John 10, our first reading, we heard uh, the Lord Jesus describe himself as the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Uh, shepherd imagery gets used quite a bit in the scriptures, doesn't it? Um, in Isaiah 63, for example, uh, Moses is described as being a shepherd who took the people of Israel through the sea. Well, Hebrews has already told us that Jesus is much greater than Moses. He's a much greater shepherd. In Ezekiel 34, God promised his uh, people who had not been led well that he would provide them with a shepherd descended from David who would lead them well. Well, friends, Jesus is that promised shepherd. And indeed, Psalm 23, probably one of the most famous passages in the Bible, starts off, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, friends, our Lord Jesus is the Lord of Psalm 23, who cares well for his people and who even today is interceding for us at the right hand of the Father as we come before God in prayer. And so as we think about that wonderful verse, and it is wonderful, the descriptions that we see there of God, isn't it? As we think about that, we are told God is the one who gives us peace so we can approach him with confidence. He is the one who loved us so much that he gave us his one and only son, he is the one who has kept his promises that were made about the new covenant. He is faithful. And through the resurrection of Jesus, he demonstrates his power. The God that we pray to, friends, is a God of peace who loves us, who is faithful to his promises and who can do things with his power that we just simply cannot imagine. That's the God to whom we pray. That's the God to whom this writer is praying. And notice what he prays for in verse 21. He prays that they would be equipped with everything good for doing God's will and that he may work in us what is pleasing to him. Uh, remember that the writer is desperately concerned that his readers persevere in the faith that they do not give up, but they actually grow in Christian maturity. We've heard as we've worked our way through Hebrews that if we're not growing, we'll be going backwards. He doesn't want them going backwards. He wants them growing to be more and more like Jesus, doing the good, following the example of Jesus, pleasing God, following the example of Jesus. This is a prayer, friends, for Christian maturity. It's a prayer for Christian maturity. And uh, here is this writer, he has uh, just written this majestic sermon to them uh, where he's pleading with them to keep on following Jesus and, and you kind of look at it and he gives them every reason to keep on following Jesus. But he doesn't just stop with the writing. No, he recognises ultimately he needs God's power to be at work in the hearts of those people so that they will grow. And so he prays. 
Help them to grow. Equip them with everything they need to do good and to please you, God. Uh, Friends, uh, my ministry here is not limited to preaching. There's lots of things involved. But as I keep saying, prayer is the chief work. I, I can preach the most amazing sermon to you. But unless God is at work, changing your hearts, it will make no difference. And so let me ask you, are we praying for one another? That we would be growing in Christian maturity. Are we praying for that? Well, in the survey we had this question. I pray regularly for my sisters and brothers in Christ to grow in Christian maturity. And what we see is that it's around uh, 47 to 48% agree or strongly agree. Friends, that number needs to be higher. If we're going to grow in Christian maturity, we need to be praying that we'll be growing in Christian maturity. Uh, One of uh, the aspects of our vision is that we would grow in our love for God, love for one another, and in compassion for those who are in spiritual, physical or emotional need. Well, we're only going to grow in those ways as we pray for one another to grow in those ways. And so I want to urge you, Start praying, if you're not doing so already, if you're not one of the strongly agrees or agrees, start praying regularly for your sisters and brothers in Christ to grow in Christian maturity. Now, it might be that you want to just, uh, if if you're looking for an easy way to start, think of the people in your small group and pray for them. If you're not in a small group, it'd be great if you joined one. If you're not in a small group, uh, maybe think about people that you do know okay, uh, that you get on quite well with and commit yourself to praying for those people to grow in Christian maturity. Now, an easy way to do that, friends, is just to take verses 20 to 21 and pray it for those people, right? So in verse 21, where it says the word you, equip you, just put a blank there and name the different people that you want to see grow in Christian maturity. So the writer to the Hebrews has given us a prayer to read out that we can use in a very simple and easy way to pray for people to grow in Christian maturity. Again, friends, we don't grow unless God is at work. And God works as we pray. God works as we pray. Now, the final prayer that we're going to focus on brings us to our third point, which is that the writer of Hebrews prayed for his readers to continue to experience the blessings of God's grace. And uh, the book of Hebrews finishes with these words, grace be with you all. Grace be with you all. Uh, A lot of the New Testament letters finish in that kind of way. Titus finishes in exactly the same way. Grace be with you all. What's the writer mean? He's, He's effectively praying a blessing. May the blessings of God's grace be something that you continue to experience. Remember, he wants them to persevere. He wants them to experience the blessings of God's grace and not to miss out on those blessings. He doesn't want them to fall short of God's grace. And so his last prayer is, may you continue to experience the great blessings of God's grace. Now, friends, grace, of course, is God's attitude of undeserved generosity. Uh, We don't deserve forgiveness. Uh, We don't deserve eternal life. We don't deserve the gift of the Spirit. Uh, We don't deserve all the good things that God gives us. But out of grace, he does. And so this prayer is really asking, Lord, for the people I'm praying for, may they continue to experience those amazing blessings that come from God's grace. Simple prayer. But it's really a prayer for the good of those that he's writing to. Now, I didn't do a uh, question in the Christian Maturity Survey about uh, whether or not we're praying for people to be blessed in that way. You can figure out whether or not you are praying for such things. But friends, it is good for us to pray that people would continue to experience the blessings of God's grace in their lives. So let me urge you to pray for that. Well, anyway, that brings us to the end of our series on the book of Hebrews. Woohoo! Two terms, working our way through this majestic book. And again, as I said to you a few weeks ago, if you could uh, really summarise what the book of Hebrews teaches in one word, 
it's the word perseverance. He is urging his readers to persevere in the faith and not to give up. Uh, He's saying don't give up on Jesus because in Jesus come all the blessings of God's grace. In Jesus alone there is forgiveness. In Jesus alone there is eternal life. Jesus is the one who now intercedes on uh, on, on our behalf before the Father. Jesus is what we need, is who we need if we want to spend eternity with God and enjoy all the blessings of his grace. So persevere, persevere. But today we've also seen that part of the process of perseverance is to be praying and praying for the perseverance of others, praying that people would grow in Christian maturity so that they persevere to the end. So with all that in mind, I'm going to pray for us now using the words of verses 20 to 21. So now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you all, with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.